This is about London too. Um, as a little green fringe on my conference badge indicates, this is my first time at NASIS. In fact, it's the first time I've ever been in a room with so many cartographers in my whole life. So as you can see from the fact I'm the only person wearing a tie here, I'm a stranger. <laughs> but Kierkegaard said that truth is always with the minority, so I'm okay with that. It really is a privilege to be here. Thank you uh, for attending this session. I'm going to talk about uh, the map that Eric and I have been working on of neighborhoods and localities in London. And after I've talked about some just preliminary thoughts I have, Eric's going to take you through the process and confront some of the theoretical issues that we've had to make a contact with. So my primary field as a scholar is poetry. And I think my appreciation of cartography centers on the artistic dimension of map making, which I must say has been very much present in what we've been talking about today. And those feelings about maps are summed up for me in Vermeer's The Geographer. A man is standing by a window gazing into his imagination. He holds compasses in his right hand. He grips a book with his left. Over his head, rhyming with his head, is a globe. His head is a world. A world is his head. The leading in the windows he stares through is the projected cipher of the grid projection of the, of the map that the man pours over. Like the map, the painting that the man is in flattens a three-dimensional world into two dimensions, but it's nonetheless a medium of truth. The drawn curtain in the picture is a symbol of intellectual and even mystical revelation. The man looks up mesmerized. Maps are a stimulus not just to action, not just to getting there, but to reverie. For a moment, he is the map. He's wearing a Japanese robe, and with a blue exterior and an orange lining, he has a kind of symbolic representation of the meeting point of sea and land on his body. Maps so utilitarian are also so deeply meditative, and I hope we never lose contact with the reverie dimension of map making. Maps transform us with maps. At best, we lose ourselves. I implied a moment ago that cartography seems like a different world than poetry, which, as I said, is my primary object of study, but that isn't really true. And in fact, a lot of significant poets from Dante and Milton through to Auden and Elizabeth Bishop have shown a long and totally non-accidental fascination with maps. It was Bishop who aligned the aesthetic dimension of cartography with her own poetic practice when she wrote, more delicate than the historians are the map maker's colors. Mapping and writing are convergent. So the map we're talking about today is a part of a historical mapping project called Kindred London, which I've been working on and hoping to la launch for several months now. And at this point in my text, there's an ironic uh, comment in quotations and square brackets that says, pause here for ironic grimace. But I am going to launch it soon. This map that we're presenting to you is part of the project, but by no means the whole thing. Like many efforts, our own map making started out small, but it got bigger. While we've been working on this map, I've found my mind haunted by a photograph taken from Flickr. It's by Duncan Harris, who is a prolific documenter of London scenes, and it shows a moment he captured at the top of the monument, which is the monument, the, the building or the, the memorial that gives its name to the station that Ken was talking about, famously complex history for that station. The column was designed by Hook and Wren and completed in 1667 on the site of the incinerated church of St. Margaret Fish Street as a memorial to the destruction from the Great Fire of 1666. The monument thus stands right in the middle of the city of London. Wren and Hook designed it as a scientific instrument 
because they also conducted experiments about barometric pressure variation as well as a memorial artwork. And the monument's viewing platform sits just underneath an amazing emblem of rebirth, a huge gilded urn of flames. Harris's photographs show some gulls either on or around the cage on the viewing platform, looming over the photographer and drawing our gaze away from the city panorama. It's an image of eerie closeness. Every bird that moves unwittingly around Wren and Hook's seething ball of flames becomes, just for a moment, an avatar of a phoenix rising out of the scene of destruction. Separating us from the tip of Renzo Piano's shard across the river, the clouds and the gulls, is the mesh of the cage over the viewing platform put there in the 19th century to stop people diving to their deaths from this emblem of rebirth. The mesh on the monument is the barrier between the human and natural world. It's the protective and definitional grid that you see when you look. Rigid but wavy, oscillating, the mesh brings nature close but at the same time holds nature apart. It organizes the world and it stylizes the world. To throw an analytic grid over reality, and that's obviously what any map has to do, is like standing inside a cage of one's own creation. What kind of enabling cage could Eric and I make for Kindred London? One that wasn't simply a bewildering transcription of random facts, an endless plunge into non-meaning, and yet one that at the same time brought you close to the reality of the city's life world, to the breathing of the birds. <laughs> So Kindred London has four historic maps dating from 1682 through to 1896 as its canvases. And at the beginning, all I was looking for was a way of mapping London districts and actually being able to define them. It's easy to become familiar with names of London districts, Camberwell, Bermondsey, Piccadilly, Soho. But challenge anybody to stick a pin in the map of London and locate a single point in these areas and you're unlikely to be successful. Still less successful is drawing the definition or the perimeters of a district. So we needed a district map as a data layer to throw over the historical maps. We're looking at, a, at the canvas. There, here is uh, John Rock's map of London from 1745 to 46. What existed for us as we took on that task was sometimes secret. So as in, for example, the case of the polygons that Google, just to be polite, uh, uses to derive its public facing centroids for district labels. Or what exists seems amazingly crude and wrong, either unreal angular jigsaw shapes projecting a useless vision of abstract vagueness or large, purely administrative or governmental demarcations, such as the London government's segregation of the city into these massive, unwieldy boroughs, entities that have bureaucratic meaning, but no relation to lived experience. London today is one of the most intensively quantified and surveyed cities on the planet. Terabytes of data flow off the metropolis every day. To take just one example, recently noted by the Financial Times, an estimated 420,000 CCTV cameras operate in and around London, making it the second most uh, monitored city in the world after Beijing, which has about 470,000 cameras. The th city in third place is Washington DC, which has about 30,000 CCTV cameras. So an incredible amount of difference between Washington DC and London and Beijing. And yet on the forest floor of everyday lived experience, ambiguities abound in London. Where am I? A question not easy to answer at all. Until a few years ago, you and Mills ran a beautiful crowdsourced website about the cognitive difficulties of defining a modest sized trendy little up and coming district in East London called Dalston. The title of Ewan's website tells you all you need to know about the heated disagreement amongst people about where Dalston is. The title of the site is, this isn't fucking Dalston. 
it's okay to use the F word in English. It's more a space to breathe in. It's, it has no real referential meaning. But there is a reality to this contention and uncertainty. Precision and clarity are not necessarily truthful. And ambiguity, at least to someone like me who works with words, ambiguity embodies a kind of truth. So how to capture that? Our chosen aesthetic has a biomorphic quality. Why? Well, it's very London specific to make something biomorphic. The term biomorphism was coined by an English poet, Geoffrey Grigson, in 1935, very much at the same time as Beck was just rolling out the first edition of his map for the underground. Specifically, Grigson's word biomorphism, specifically in relation to painting and sculpture. Grigson moved in the circle of London-based sculptors like Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth, who in the 1930s were exploring the dialogue between the obduracy and hardness of stone and the softness of organic rounded forms. And the great example of biomorphic mapping of London appeared in the County of London plan for post-war renewal published in 1943. That's the image that you can see on the screen at the moment. Um, Patrick Abercrombie, the great city planner, is usually attributed the uh, authorship of this map, but it was obviously a, a collective work. And Abercrombie's wartime map has recently inspired a London architect and city planner, Adam Towell, to compi compile his own biomorphic version of London districts. Looking at Abercrombie's wartime map and Adam's follow-up, it's obvious that there's a kind of visual poetry to the biomorphic map aesthetic. Biomorphism brings the world of natural forms into art and expresses the sense of something having emerged out of historical realities, of having been shaped by the long, fluctuating story of the city, like the outlines of the stones on the shores of the Thames, slowly battered into rounded shapes by the movement of the city's major geographical feature. Those beautifully various stones, so copious on the banks of the Thames in central London, are mainly the remnants of old bricks dumped on the river's shores during and immediately after the London Blitz as sites of destroyed buildings were being cleared. Over decades, they've responded to the movements of the river and the soft force of the rain and their neighbors' shapes and have become biomorphic, going from being manufactured objects to being natural objects. Here's the map that Eric and I are working towards. Let me hand over to you, over to Eric now, who can explain some of the ways that we got here and some of the stakes in play in mapping spaces that exist as much in people's heads as in official definitions. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at NASIS after a few years off. Um, embedded in any map, and especially contested, vague, and emotional spaces, are many connected and overlapping understandings and meanings. These meanings and relationships and connections are often made invisible when the final map is produced. Um, we do not have a cartographic syntax and language to commonly convey those meanings in a way that's legible. And the same can be said for the experience and process of making the map itself and the authorship of it and the experience of the individual doing the design work. Our motivations, our interests, our assumptions, and curiosity that drive us to deeply engage with these subjects uh, are less revealed uh, in the final product. For me, this project has reflected many different interests, a series of connected and overlapping uh, interests that have been tumbled through the detritus of the Thames and, the, and, and uh, had many degrees of formation over time. First, it's the essential drive to grapple with, the, uh, grapple with and honor and relate to the human experience and understand how that experience is shaped by and shapes our landscapes. 
Second is about place and its role in identity formation, connection, and empowerment. And here I'm drawing from my own experiences at a, as a community organizer helping to build resilience, security, and trust into my own neighborhood through collective art projects and tactical, tactical urbanism, uh, such as this 200-person uh, uh, mural that we created uh, in our neighborhood. Collectivism is at the core here, uh, and I've always been fascinated by non-hierarchical systems. When a collection of sentient but independent organisms without any central control, no singular authority can give rise to structural form, order and beauty through a dynamic layering of interactions. These forms are often ephemeral, as in swarm behavior, but as, the, as is the case with another project that I'm working on with renowned ant biologist Deborah Gordon, sometimes these forms are formed, are created over 30 to 40 years of interactions between individual ant colonies in an otherwise relatively undifferentiated desert space. Here you see the territories, um, spaces carved out by these uh, individual ant colonies in essence, to, to help them survive as individuals, but ultimately evenly distributing the food resources across the entire species um, for their support over, uh, over many years. Deserts have, a way of, deserts have a way of creating borders and boundaries, and I'm equally fascinated by these edges, borders, crossings, boundings, that are often physical and equally often invisible, perceived or conceptual, inclusion, exclusion, belonging, vulnerability. As we appreciated from Kate's talk last night, edges are places of control, authority, uh, conflict, but edges are also places of connection, mobility, interaction, and engagement. We have only to look to the language of graph theory or edges are defined not as divisions, but connections between nodes in a network. I'm inspired by these kinds of reframings and their impact on design. While anathema to spatial data models, reconfiguring our assumptions about what we are saying with polygons, uh, that is to say, we should reconfigure the way uh, we think about our assumptions uh, in how we use polygons and lines. This is true, uh, this was true in my now ancient uh, graduate uh, thesis <laughs> where I examined uh, the relationship between different symbolic forms of region representation, boundary representation, and people's conceptions of those spaces. And I used the effect of distance estimation to measure the impact of those different symbologies. The effect was pretty strong. The basic conclusion was this. Strong psychological barriers demarcated by lines on a map actually create an effect where people interpret distances between places in different regions as much further than distances within the same region. Let's return to the project at hand. Neighborhoods, districts, localities have both captured the imagination and also flummoxed geographers and cartographers and urban planners for decades. While the planning concept of a neighborhood has been thoroughly problematized as an exclusionary and homogenizing practice, more recent work argues that the concept may have both explanatory value, that is to say, in dis, uh, explaining the distribution of crime, real estate value, etc., and is, despite its vagueness, an essential scale and unit from which to mobilize community itself through the development of urban gardens, uh, the support of mental health, and resilience of vulnerable populations. Neighborhoods, names, uh, and localities no doubt have a value to give meaning to place. Social, economic, political, and often physical factors play a dominant role in producing and maintaining these identities but maps also play a role. It's not surprising that mapping services have very limited neighborhood information. But it is unfortunate that one of the few things that are so personally meaningful to people and help people connect with one another 
and are important about space in everyday lives is largely missing from most maps. Many wonderful projects have, have engaged with these questions and have developed such maps, and ours is not particularly distinctive, uh, nor is its method particularly innovative. Um, it doesn't draw from a sophisticated uh, 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 artificial intelligence algorithm, or, nor does it collate thousands of bottom-up self-reported delineations of space, as in the case the, of Andy Woodruff's really impressive project as he did on the neighborhoods of Boston. But rather, our work is more of a meditation on the ways in which these areas of London are already represented and how those areas might be reconciled, curated, handcrafted, and made to work together. Uh, and so what I'll do transition now here, how much time do we have? Just two minutes, two minutes okay. I'll just change in here to show a few slides from the, from the map itself and the process we used. Um, it was largely driven by a process of mining existing data sets that were available, um, looking at uh, wiki, wiki data, gazetteers, et cetera, and also driving up from the label sets that you could derive from existing mapping services. Here you see Google and Apple labels for this zoomed in portion of the map. The addition of the NAT cases and Nathaniel von Kelso's great work on who's on first labels. Uh, here's the centroids for those labels the integration of administrative districts, as Nick referred to, uh, the use of quattro shapes, uh, which is de derived from social media data. Uh, here's Google polygons, which are very few, Airbnb, and a, uh, a service called Zoopla, which is similar to Zillow in the US. Uh, so the combination of all these shapes creates a kind of uh, amalgamation of source files. Uh, that set of sources, of course, is completely irreconcilable. Um, but uh, as, the, uh, as all cartographers should be uh, excited and inspired to do, your job is really to reconcile <laughs> and to handle that complexity. Um, and so we drafted uh, using this concept of biomorphics moving uh, versus, you know, which might contrast with the kind of industry standard of, the, of, of generalization uh, to generate a, our kind of first draft of what those shapes may look like. And in the spirit of, of Ken Field's OCD, we decided to contact um, Adam Tal and Ollie O'Brien um, and actually Ken uh, to contribute to the interpretation and validation of these spaces that we created. And so we printed using, uh, we wrote a script in R to create uh, 290 of these maps of each of these places. We printed them all, we put them in a big envelope about this thick and we shipped them off and we said, please mark up these maps and tell us what's wrong with them. Uh, and remarkably, people responded. Uh, and we got uh, a tremendous number of, of results back, collated those in a database, hand um, digitized everything back into our data sets. You can see here a case of many conflicting um, conclusions about these spaces. We integrated all those edits together, um, and then we created a new set of those final, final um, biomorphic shapes. Uh, as far as exploring the aesthetics behind it, uh, we were interested in emphasizing the kind of contiguity of those spaces, so we added a smoothing uh, generalization again to the edges, and then we combined it with our, the existing, the edit uh, re recommendations from the experts, uh, and then uh, in included a, a really light layer, which you couldn't see up here, but it's the, um, is all the sources that went into the creation of it. Um, the final touch to it was to really look at this issue of how much, how stable each of these spaces were and how they vary across the sources that are available and the experts that may have disagreed. Um, and so we created um, a coefficient of variation for each of the entities. And then this is a, just a tree map of what that looks like based on the comparison of the area um, represented by size and color, meaning the, um, the stability of those shapes. And then we map that onto the line work and then combine that with our final image. And so you get a sense of areas that are um, stable and instable depending on uh, agreement and disagreement in those spaces. Just returning briefly to, oh, and just to the label set that we added. Um, just returning briefly in conclusion is thinking about the possibility of this map as an overlay into spaces um, in combination with present day um, you know, base maps or historic maps of the city. 
In further work, I wonder if we might analyze the gaps and overlaps uh, between these spaces, the hard edges versus the soft ones, and find a layer that maybe is instructive in other ways uh, to discover places of energy and contact, opportunity and stability, identity and vulnerability. Uh, might such a map be more interesting uh, to a housing analyst, an urban planner, or even a tourist walking the city, understanding the complexities of the space as they walk through it, as opposed to tube uh, stations and landmarks. I'll end there. I'm grateful for your attention and all of your inspiration you provided the project over the time. <laughs>